What is popping, everyone? I am your host, Justin Woodward, co-founder of The Mix, the Media Indie Exchange, and team in Terabang Entertainment, as well as lead advisor on the Humble Black Game Developer Fund and Black Voice in Gaming. Welcome to The Mix 10-year anniversary edition of Black Voices in Gaming, where we will be celebrating amazing Black developers and their games. I am joined with my homie and part of the leadership squad of Black Voice in Gaming, Alfonso Hooker. How is it going? What's going on? Um, my name is Alfonso Hooker. I am co-founder of Black Voices in Gaming and also Tech Perfect, which is a consulting company focused on uh, leadership and development opportunities for women and folks of color in tech. That's what's up. Yeah, I mean, this is going to be an amazing showcase. We have some developers. We have some interviews. This is live, so I may be talking to our folks out here. Um, <laughs> you guys got to turn the the, the uh, music down a little bit in my headphones. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the mix showcase was, was pretty good. Um, and we do have a great lineup of uh, Black developers and industry professionals who will be having conversations with and sharing their games. Um, games yeah, and uh, a little bit about uh, Black Voices in Gaming. It was created back in 2020 of June during the protests and demonstrations that united us all over the world. We have been working on Black Voices in Gaming over the past two years and transformed it from a broadcast showcase into a movement where we not only share developers' games, but we are also now a nonprofit that is set up to accelerate the growth of professional game developers. And our mission is to help game studio entrepreneurs by giving them introductions to funding resources, publishers, press, and mentors that will help them succeed. So maybe we could just chop it up a little bit and yeah. talk about what, what we've kind of been up to. Yes. So the past two years, we've been putting this together and really focusing on um, the pipeline for all of the developers that we've been working with. We have amazing developers on the show. Uh, we had Tony Barnes and all these folks who we've been connected with. And what we've seen is that there's been these gaps in funding resources, marketing, uh, publishing, and through some of the networks that Justin has put together, his, his work with uh, Humble and all the other organizations we're partnered with is essentially taking this um, idea and turned it into a full-fledged nonprofit that we're actually going to be funding these these games and these amazing black voices that we're going to be featuring. Yeah, and I mean, like I said, we started this in 2020 to, during the civil unrest. I, as a black game developer, was having a lot of trouble finding funds, mentorship, and that type of thing. So now we're able to extend that. I mean, Humble's been very awesome. We've signed 28 games there. I've work, been working with Xbox and PlayStation, which we're going to lead into our sponsors, too. So shout out to our sponsors for today's showcase, Raw Fury, who helped get the series started and is helping with the funding for the series uh, throughout the year, PlayStation, they've been amazing from day one. Razor, who we've been working with through this and the mix. Um, yeah, so where else can we support the devs? We can support the devs all over. I mean, we, I think there's, uh, by primarily going to the events page, the uh, mix events page on Steam, going and uh, buying those games, but also wishlisting the games that are not available. But please check that box. Check, check that box. Okay, so to get started, we have a professional AAA game programmer at Sony San Diego, who is also an advocate for black devs and indie professionals. We have Kojo here. Um, and can you uh, can we please turn the sound down for Spirit Swap? Oh, wow. <laughs> hey, everybody. Hey, hey Kojo, um, how's it going? Not bad, not bad. Good to see y'all. Happy to be here. Man, it's so, it's uh, super amazing that you're here, yes. uh, Kojo. You're such an advocate for black game developers and developers in general, and you are just a staple in the industry for being an engineer. And I think we should just get started with a little bit of your history. I think people really want to know um, what you're about and what you're actually doing at PlayStation. Uh, sorry, I think it froze a little bit for me. I might have missed your first question. Oh, yeah. So just tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you got into game development and, and what you do at uh, at PlayStation. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm a, my current title is Gameplay Programmer, and I'm based in San Diego. Um, I was working with San Diego Studios, and I'm with a different organization there now. And I've been a game developer since 2008 actually started my career in New York City. Uh, I went to school at NYU. I studied computer science and cinema studies. There was no game center there at the time, so I uh, didn't have like a game program to study. But what was interesting is 
My second job out of school, I actually worked at a small company called Area Code that was founded by Frank Lance, who was the founder of the NYU Game Center. And so actually working with him, I was able to go to a lot of those talks and whatnot uh, over the years and get kind of um, enmeshed in the New York like game scene. And I was really into that stuff, like all those academic discussions and whatnot. So did that for years, went indie slash freelance for a few years, moved out to San Diego, was an IGA organizer for a while, and now I'm at PlayStation. Dope, dope. Now, what are you currently working on right now? Uh, I'm definitely not at liberty to say, but I can say that it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, once it is released, I will be telling everybody. But uh, I'm excited about the work awesome. that I'm doing right now. It's different than anything I've done You'll be sharing that with us first, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah. you, you'll be notified. That's, you'll be notified. Okay. That's cool. What, are you, what, what have you worked on before? What are some of the, uh, the past titles that you're, you're super proud of being a developer on? Yeah, like I've worked on a wide variety of things, you know, like, again, I started my career in like casual web games. So we were making uh, virtual worlds in Flash, worked on a bunch of Facebook games. Uh, when I was freelancing, I worked on a really interesting project. Um, it was a citizen science project for Connectomics to help map the brain. So the idea there is they had uh, data oh, wow. from a, um, a mouse um, cerebrum and you would scan it and actually identify different parts of it to see if you could track the, um, the tubes of it in 3D. Uh, I worked on a really cool Transformers boxing game for mobile. That was the first uh, Unity game I ever worked on. Uh, at Sony San Diego, I worked on the MLB The Show franchise for many years and that was really, really cool. Uh, that was my first time doing server programming as well. I got super deep into that. Uh, but ironically, I think the game I might be most proud of was a political game I made during the 2016 presidential cycle. It was a, a whack-a-mole game <laughs> called Bop the Bigot, where it was this kind of tongue-in-cheek <laughs> game. Where you, <laughs> you would hit uh, Trump, Joe Arpaio, and uh, David Duke with a, with a chancla, like a Mexican slipper. And I uh, did it with this uh, this nonprofit wow. group that was organizing voter registration in Arizona, and it got got a little traction, and that was a lot of fun to work on. That's dope. I really like that. That's dope. So, like, how? Because you, so you jumped into AAA. You've been into um, independent game development. Like, what? What? Do, how do you like that kind of mix mixture of development, like solo, and uh, you know, as opposed to doing big game studio work? No, for sure. I, I feel like I've, I've talked to my peers about this kind of recently. I felt like when I was an independent, I learned a tremendous amount because I had to. And that was really interesting to go really wide in terms of my skills and my interests. But at a AAA studio on a really big team, you know, you go really deep on something specific. You know, you're not just the gameplay programmer. You know, you might be focused on animation or combat or inventory, etc. So. I definitely appreciate both experiences. I've done a lot of work on smaller teams and individually, but I like being on bigger teams now where I can really dive deep on something specific. Nice, nice. Now, I think that one of the uh, things that's super important that we want folks to understand is like, how did you like, how do you get into a game, like becoming a game developer? What was sort of, sort of your journey into that sort of thing? Cause like, there's tons of folks out here who want to actually become developers don't know how actually how hard it is to actually build a game because I think people don't understand that it's it's not easy at all. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. No, making games is hard. Uh, I would definitely say, uh, and it's different now than when I started in 2008, and definitely like when when you started, Justin. Um, there's so many more schools and programs now. There's so many free engines now. So. Ironically, I think that making a game has become easier than ever uh, because they're really tools that are readily available. Uh, I'm not sure if it's necessarily gotten easier to get into the industry, but I'll say what worked for me and what I still recommend for people is to find a community. So uh, the IG Day was that for me, IGDA in New York. I went to an event. Uh, it was interesting. I never heard people talk about like game development and design that way. At the end of the event, I met two individuals. Both of them gave me um, a business card. I ended up interning for one of them, and that was basically my foot in the door. You know, so when nice. I came to San Diego again, I didn't really know anybody here. So I became involved in the local IGA community. We organized regular mixers every month, uh, two, three game jams a year. Through that, I was able to find some freelance work. It's not the way that I ended up working at Sony, but it was definitely a way for me to build a community here and uh, get to know a lot of other developers. And I got some freelance work through it. 
So I would definitely say the first thing I would recommend if you're interested in games is to find a community of people that are interested in making games. If you have one locally at your school uh, or in your town, and if you don't have one, then you should start one. Um, start a video game development club. Uh, there's so many places you can find digitally as well, discords, itch.io. And then the next thing would just be to make a game, do a game jam, you know, just try to make something over a short amount of time and just realize, you know, what it takes, how hard it is. And if it's something that you want to do, because sometimes, you know, you go into a game jam thinking you're going to make, you know, World of Warcraft. And then by Saturday afternoon, you have like <laughs> a box moving left and right. You're like, OK, well, let's see what we can actually get. <laughs> That's hilarious. So, this is a, yeah. GTA. Yeah. I, you know, what's really interesting, though, is I think that you really touched on something is you sometimes we have to create our communities. And I'm a big advocate for that because I actually did the same thing. Fresh out. I went to Art Institute. And as you know, in San Diego, there's like Rockstar San Diego, there's Sony, there was a couple other studios and there's like Qualcomm. And I was like, I wanna do independent stuff. I wanna be creative with what, with what I'm doing. And I didn't have, there was no IGDA San Diego happening. I couldn't figure out how to connect with professionals. So I basically did the same thing. I was like, yo, let's do at Pizza Port in Carlsbad where all of those yep. folks are at. Let's have a beer. I'm gonna make a flyer, right? And like, it, I think we definitely like that's a really really good point is like you can't you can't always wait you know yeah. for a group to pop up or the best opportunity build the community. yeah you have to build a community create your community and and uh kind of like as a segue to to another part of the conversation that I wanted to have with you is I mean you're actually doing that right now um mm -hmm. at if you're comfortable talking about it with PlayStation right like yeah. we've been in communication to help developers and that's big and it's because there needs to be support can you kind of talk about the strides that you're taking uh to help out developers yeah absolutely so you know i've definitely been an advocate for game developers and game developer communities since i was an igda organizer in san diego then when i started working at a playstation in san diego i stayed in the igda group for a little while then i moved away from that and started uh, becoming a part of something that at the time was called PAN at PlayStation. That's the PlayStation African American Network. And honestly, PlayStation, that was my first like corporate gig. I never worked at like a really big company before that. So I found out there's something called DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think these things are fairly recent. So we had these um, employee resource groups, they're called employee networks now, and they're a way to get together with different folks in the company with particular affinities and to be totally honest i just wanted more black friends at work so i was like oh yeah pan i'll join that cool <laughs> so i joined that <laughs> you know i met a lot of cool people in different parts of the company with different experiences and it was just really really cool to hear um, people's experiences because you know as you guys know there's just so few black people in tech and in games uh in general you know like there's all kinds of challenges you face in this country you know for a wide variety of reasons and again making games is difficult getting hired is difficult so when you find other people similar experiences you're like wow like how did you get here you know and there's so much that you can like resonate with them about that so uh i was really into pan i was really into the community we had there and we just wanted to kind of expand and keep doing activities and doing things to advance our careers doing things to you know celebrate our culture and doing things to connect with uh, the broader Sony group and other like-minded DEI groups. So I've been involved in that for several years. Uh, the role I kind of slid myself into was uh, community outreach because I'm sort of an outgoing person anyway. I've done other community organizing. And uh, the main, uh, I guess, endeavor I've been championing lately has been this thing called the New Visions Project where me and some other folks have been really trying to support more black game developers on the PlayStation platform in really concrete and specific ways and trying to identify opportunities to connect with developers to offer them information, offer them guidance, offer them resources, and just kind of help uh, shepherd them along the process of being successful developers. Because again, in addition to not knowing how to get into the industry, once you're in, sometimes you don't even know what to do. You know, sometimes you don't know who to ask, how to get on a certain platform. You don't know how to ask for money. You so don't know true. how to, you know, create a business or have a thriving business. And I feel fortunate enough to be in a position where I, I've learned some of that information. I have access to people who can answer those questions. So I think through some of the DEI and connection work that uh, I've been doing with Justin, you know, I think we want to try to spread more of this information and make an effort to allow other people to be successful. 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it, it does seem sometimes like it's a black box, especially for everyone. Mm -hmm. And then folks who really do not have uh, the opportunities or access, it's like you definitely need kind of a lead in. So it's it's awesome what you're doing. And it's great to work on some of this stuff. Um, if you're comfortable chatting about it, what what do you what are some of the obstacles you have had as a black game to, professional in in the triple a space i mean it's it's really hard to say you know like again like making games is hard you know being a a black male in america is hard <laughs> so like it's hard for me to think of any like specific specific cross sections with that but one thing that i think i can speak to easily is just not necessarily feeling as though um I'm completely understood or recognized, you know, um, in the way I communicate and in the experiences that I have. And that can just be a challenge with communication. You know, um, if you, your leadership or your team members, you know, don't uh, have similar experiences like you, don't look like you, they don't kind of understand where you're coming from, it can make everything more difficult. And that's not to say anything specific about the team I'm on right now, but I feel as though there have been times in my career where I feel as though, um, the challenge in communication was part, part cultural, and that uh, that just kind of comes with the territory. I think that there's maybe a handful of instances where I felt like mm, this is like this is going a little left. So, so I think that with that, the challenge again for me has always been to try to focus on how do I ensure my success and how do I not get caught up in. Um, in any kind of situation or any kind of um, conflict that could detract from what I'm trying to achieve ultimately. Like, I know I'm trying to be successful in my career. I'm trying to advance. I'm trying to work on cool stuff. I'm trying to, you know, get paid. I'm trying to be a game developer, you know? So, like, if I feel like I come across something that's going to try to detract from that, I'm going to do whatever I can to move around it. And definitely having a community helps for that, you know? Like, having Black at PlayStation and, like, those coworkers that you can just kind of, like, rap with, and talk with once in a while and just really like relax it can really make um make you more comfortable at the place where you're at so that's something i'm, I'm very thankful for um in terms of being a black developer yeah that's i mean that's true just trying to keep your nose clean sometimes <laughs> in that capacity it's just like yo i gotta maneuver the bs uh just get my work done so i know i i totally feel that a lot of i think a lot of times it is that it's not like overt craziness yeah, it's, but there's the isolation yeah it's sometimes isolation or just trying to figure out how to you know maneuver um navigate the space yeah for sure okay. absolutely. absolutely awesome kojo um i really i come from the sort of the hardcore tech side the back end so you said you did some stuff on the server side what was what was that uh the experience like say going from like just traditional game development but doing actual like server server programming so it's it's wild it was really like the perfect transition for AAA, as far as i'm concerned because i started my career making flash games so those are necessarily on the web and we were making multiplayer games so i started out as a client programmer so i had a concept of how network programming works and apparently like a lot of people don't start in that way and i didn't realize it i just sort of took it for granted so i'd actually done a lot of like network programming and stuff and then um when i was freelancing i uh, worked on a multiplayer uh VR title, so I'd done end to end a little bit, but it was like um like a peer to peer thing, so you didn't have to do any authoritative work. So uh, baseball, when I got hired for them, it was actually on the online services team. So they were rewriting their server in C plus plus and a combination of C plus plus and C sharp uh, for uh, performance reasons and for other internal reasons, and they were basically looking for people to help them out to do that because it was going to be this monumental task. So really, I think they were interested in me because of my C sharp experience, because I had done a lot of Unity work. Mm -hmm. But when I went freelance, it was really an opportunity for me to dive into C++ and learn that. I had never done any C++ work professionally. I had all been self-taught. So I think once, you know, I passed the technical interview and they got me in there, they're like, oh, this guy can write some C++ too. So what was interesting about it is since the nature of the work was so rote and there was so much of a volume of it, for me, it was like, this is a time to practice C++. So I got to rewrite all these services in the old language to the new language. I got to make sure they're fast. You know, I got to make sure that uh, it's written safely because crashing is always bad. But when you crash on the server, you take down everybody. <laughs> 
So I think like the experience of um, writing server code as opposed to writing client code just had me thinking about things differently. It had me uh, becoming aware of issues that you don't have to um, think about on a client, for example, and then also operational things like if you have an issue with the data while the game is live, you know, how do you update, you know, the database or whatever without bringing the game down, you know, because you want to avoid downtime, just different kinds of problems you have to approach. So I thought it was it was incredibly uh, informative for me and also kind of an excellent way for me to like transition from the more casual side to the AAA side with like the skills I had. And then also, you know, uh, build more skills that I could take forward for, for other things. That's that's awesome. And so now you're doing more gameplay programming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm pretty much back on the client side now, which is, I think, where I wanted to be ultimately. Uh, I can definitely do uh, both ends of it, but I think that in my career, I've had most enjoyment, enjoyment doing like client side stuff, interactive stuff, like quicker reactive kind of things. So. Awesome. Awesome. Well, it's, thank you so much um, for, for joining us, Kojo. It's amazing having you and we're definitely going to be talking more. Do you want to kind of give a shout out about some of the things that you're working on uh, and how to follow you? Uh, yeah, you can definitely uh, hit me up on Twitter. Uh, did my video freeze? I'm not sure if that's just for me. Um, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's see. Um, Shucks. Well, you can definitely hit me up on Twitter as Twitter, another Kojo, uh, you know, um, usually retweeting memes, whatever I find interesting. Again, once my game is released, <laughs> I'm going to be shouting it from the mountaintop. So you're definitely going to hear about it. Uh, but I think till then, just kind of stay tuned to the work that I'm going to be doing with uh, you, Justin, and Black Voices to try to help other um, Black developers, maybe behind the scenes, maybe in front of it. But, you know, I think stay in tune to Black Voices and hopefully I'll be able to contribute to that. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Thank you so much, man. It's it's really dope to see. It, bro. Yeah, for sure. And Kojo is, is amazing. Yeah. Um, he's been working with us on, on figuring out our programs and such. Um, it's great to say, see folks taking strides to make a difference in, in and outside of like a corporate type of setting. Um, but we got a game coming up. All right. Yes. Next up, we have Chris Butler, who has a colorful game with amazing music titled Spirit Swap from Soft Not Weak. Let's check out the trailer and then we're going to hop into the game and talk to Chris. I'll spend my days as a spirit. Spirit Swap is, it's so gorgeous. It's amazing. That lo-fi hip hop vibe, super dope. We got Chris. Chris Butler is on. What is happening, Chris? It's so great to have you. What's up, folks? Great to be here. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this dude right here is going to play Spirit Swap. I don't think it's going to be too crazy. I think he's going to be able to, to kill it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, can you tell us? Uh, as we get into the game, can you just describe a little bit about the game, the gameplay, and some of the influences behind Spirit Swap? Yeah, so um, uh, our, uh, our, uh, <laughs> our creative director, Alex, uh, uh, is really into match three games. And uh, as, uh, you know, early on in development, um, and when, I, when we formed uh, Soft Nut Week, uh, Alex Morgan and I, uh, we were wanting to start with something small, <laughs> but um, 
uh, we ended up, you know, building it up into this uh, match three game with a narrative element. And uh, basically it was just all the things that we liked coming together in the game. Uh, just, you know, the music, uh, colorful graphics, as opposed to, you know, kind of, you know, grim, dark things that are out there. We wanted to have something that was more um, low stakes, fun, colorful, interesting characters, um, a game with uh, uh, really relaxing sort of gameplay. Although, <laughs> um, as we continue to develop and uh, develop two player mode, uh, things get a little competitive and maybe not so <laughs> so down tempo, but uh, uh, yeah, um, I think uh, a lot of the inspirations are uh, mostly, I guess, just kind of us putting things that we like in the game. Um, uh, for example, a lot of the designs of the uh, environment and the characters are um, from uh, Alex's uh, home country uh, of Lebanon and uh, pulling inspirations from that. And um, cool. along with that, um, just as we put ourselves into the game, like, you know, the music that we like, um, which uh, I, I think early in development, uh, you know, it was the start of pandemic. We were inside, locked in, and we, uh, I believe Alex found our composer, Melty Cannon. Um, and uh, oh, nice. it was, we, were, we were just That's like, cool. this, this music, I don't know, <laughs> it just gave us life, <laughs> you know? Um, and so we were like, we, we need to work with uh, Melty Cannon uh, uh, to get his sound and uh, influence in the game. And yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, it definitely yeah, exactly. slaps on a chill on a like on a chill vibe. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know yeah, how, if you could say slaps on a chill vibe, but it has yeah, but it has. Yeah, that, that it, it definitely has a vibe. Like what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. When I first when I actually first played it, I just mm -hmm. I, I played it for some time because I was just like so inundated with work. It just made me chill. It was funny was I I even turned it off. Like I stopped playing the game and I was working and I just kept the game up <laughs> just like <laughs> letting it loose just listening to music. that's really cool I, i've done that myself <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah what it, what are some of the games that you pulled from like you know to influence it i mean from from yeah. your perspective i mean i see a little mm -hmm. bit of puzzle fighter i see a little bit of mm -hmm. yoshi's cookie like yeah you know. yeah um i think the the main uh sort of inspiration was panel de pawn on uh, uh, oh, uh okay Super Nintendo, which I think is also known as Tetris Attack or Pokemon Puzzle League, and I think other oh League yes titles. Um, yeah. So uh, as far as mechanics, um, that's a, a big portion of uh, the inspiration. But we're trying to add our own twist with um, spells, um, which uh, I don't know if you see. There's a little gauge on the side of the the uh, play field there. If you see a little emblem yeah. up here and you hit uh, Alt. Uh, or if you're on controller, it might be one of the buttons. Um, you can cast a spell that will clear uh, the top half of the Maybe. stage. So we're you may have to, to bust some buttons out. All right. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, we're oh, no, no, no. so that's the the spell no, no, no. icon, which uh, but is <laughs> that's fine. But um, but yeah, we're trying to. Oh, what oh, was that? It, it? did there he just? It is. <laughs> oh, okay, so. cool. That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, um, so we're trying to mix it up with uh, that mechanic, um, and we had different characters, and um, also uh, you can, as the game, uh, in, the, in the main game, there's a narrative element, and you'll uh, get items you can equip to get different spells, and uh, or not items to equip, but put in your room to uh, get different spells and that kind of thing. That's cool. Yeah. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna jump. From back from the game to you and back to the game, possibly. I, I want to know a little bit about your history and how you got into uh, development, and then uh, you know help to to be a part of this and start this team. Uh, yeah. Um, so I guess uh, ever since I was little, um, uh, I guess I guess yeah. <laughs> Starting from uh, my dad was always into computers, so like I've just in like. That kind of stuff. So I'd been playing games. I'd been on a computer as early as I can remember, and um, that being the case, played a lot of video games and wanted to know how to make them. Um, so, yeah, throughout my life, um, you know, I, I'd 
been learning how to program. My dad had programming books, so I'd uh, try and read them. Um, but um, actually career and <laughs> getting into, into games in general, I, I started off in animation. Um, I went to school and oh, studied cool. media arts and animation. So um, I did that, but actually I didn't go into animation for some about five years later, because right out of school, I moved to Japan. Um, and uh, at first I taught English, and then I got a job in an ad agency. Um, and that's probably where I first started using like programming, uh, because uh, for certain projects, they would need like web work. And I would, you know, doing basic things with JavaScript and whatnot. Um, I just was, you know, using it on the job and, and learning from there. And, you know, also in my free time, uh, and I think uh, uh, just as a uh, previous guest had said, uh, learn, trying to make Flash games, um, I learned a lot of uh, ActionScript, which, you know, uh, is also kind of related to JavaScript as well. So, um, yeah, from there I, I built up those skills. Um, and uh, after returning to the U.S., um, I was looking for work and, I uh, uh, was still uh, doing some freelance web design, um, and since I was mostly self-taught, I, you know, kind of didn't have, uh, you know, uh, I guess, you know, kind of the confidence, <laughs> even though I had, I, I may have had the skills at the time, so I, I got a certification, and then from there, um, yeah, I, most of my gaming development work had been in personal projects and things like that, um, but, uh, um, I had developed more kind of the professional side of programming skills with my work on web design and I did, you know, uh, some uh, working at a startup, I learned a little bit of back end as well, uh, um, making a mobile app um, and uh, uh, working with uh, other team members, uh, Morgan and Alex, uh, when we... <laughs> I guess at first we were like, hey, you know what? We have a lot of skills here. Why don't we try making a game? And uh, uh, yeah, and I guess <laughs> I guess that's what brings us to Spirit Swap today. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's Sorry, cool. And you guys had a successful, yeah, you guys had a <laughs> successful Kickstarter. Uh, can you talk about kind of the journey of developing this game? Because I know it always is a journey uh, yes, from yeah, development, yeah. <laughs> funding, all that kind of thing. Right, right. Um, so, yeah, uh, we had, uh, you know, started uh, working on the game. And, um, and I think perhaps <laughs> we were at a point where, uh, uh, it, it, and I think the, the pandemic did have a little bit of an effect on it because, like, we were just, like, indoors all the time we're like what are we going to do with all this time let's you know buckle down and make this game and uh and then we started and then we we're like all right and things started picking up um and you know we had reached out to uh, melty cannon and he agreed to help us with the music um we had uh reached out uh to others to you know you know get help on how to start a game and whatnot and uh uh, yeah, and then we were like, I think it's time to uh, do a Kickstarter, and um, and uh, yeah, we were you know asking around for advice of what amounts we should start with and whatnot, and um, we decided on an amount of seventy five thousand uh, dollars, and a lot of people were were maybe a little uh, thinking maybe we should you know bring the amount down, and. But that's the amount that we needed to be able to, you know, properly pay um, the people we want to work with and invest in the things we need. And we started the Kickstarter and we doubled our goal uh, and made uh, 150000 which uh, was... That's so I know, dope. Very yeah, good that's sign. really good. Like, I love um, this game. Because we... You know, it's something that we put ourselves into, and it was really great to see that, you know, so many other people also uh, enjoy it as much as we do, <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that's that's really cool. Does, so, like, can you talk? Because, I mean, it's, it's really interesting that you said uh, that you were talking about, you know, kind of that core philosophy of paying your team correctly can you t go into that because i don't think every yeah. you know every indie most indie studios are like 
fly by the seat of their pants and like we'll figure it out but you you all are really focused on making sure that everybody is included and right, you know are getting right. properly and paid and that type of thing uh yes and uh, we're structured as a worker-owned co-op um so um wow we're all we're all owners in this um so we're trying to um we're, we're, to start off with making a co-op in the u.s is quite tricky and <laughs> that's uh, a big challenge that uh, we've come up against uh, but we're, we're working through it and have a lot of uh, great people uh, to get advice from but um, yeah so we want because right now we can't bring all of our our contractors in but we are we want to make sure that uh, one that while they are working for us that they you know can live on <laughs> you know the work that uh, that uh, we're doing together, and if, when the game makes it, we can, you know, you know, I guess bring everyone, bring everyone in, and be part owners as well. Um, uh, but yeah, um, it's really important for us that uh, you know, Soft Nut Week uh, doesn't end up being like this entity that is just out for money, um, and that we, you know, take care of, uh, you know, the people we work with. For sure, um, I think I'm gonna play, and then okay, I'm gonna yes. I'm gonna t turn it like okay. <laughs> turn it over to Alfonso, awesome. so he, so I'm not bombarding you with questions. <laughs> the the name of your studio, Soft Not Weak. Where does that come from? Because it's a very interesting name. I, yeah, I think it, it it speaks a lot to what you guys are trying to build. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually a, a quote from the sci-fi series Farscape. Um, uh, oh, nice. I did not know that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think not a direct quote, but, you know, it's definitely the core inspiration of it. And I think it, it is a an aspect that, you know, you know, the world, you know, <laughs> I don't know. A lot of times people are like, you know, you got to be hard and tough and, you know, and, yeah. and all that kind of thing. But strength is not ne necessarily about being like this tough hard thing you know uh, or, so to speak you know it's like you know you can be soft and strong or you know soft and not weak right. um a lot of martial arts are built on on that as well like uh, not rigid doesn't actually isn't stronger, stronger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so right. it's it's good it's um fragile. and then just playing the game is one of the things that that was sort of really amazing was like because i can play this game for hours and not like it's it's a it's a awesome after work de-stress kind of game because it's got like the candy crush meets an r&b mixtape sort of feel to it <laughs> that, that i really really love <laughs> no, and i can just like play and chill and like just vibe with the music and, and like do the matching and like and then trying to get better at it uh without like a bunch of anxiety like no one's trying to shoot me or or, or run me over or I'm like, <laughs> and, and, and you know sometimes you need a break from that especially as a, yeah. as a person of color in this world you, you need a little uh something to distress with so i, I think yeah, that's and that's uh, even, uniquely important and, yeah and even in the the narrative that uh, is being written for the game we didn't want it to be like this big you have to save the world or everyone will die kind of thing. It's just you prepping for a party <laughs> with your friends, essentially. Oh, is that it? Um, that, yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. yeah. Can you can you kinda can you go into the narrative? Because that's really interesting. I, I did um, not know. Sure. Um, yeah, so uh, I I can I actually I've not read too deeply because I didn't want to spoil myself, but <laughs> uh, but uh, oh, okay. but, I, but I do know like uh, the the basic uh, outline of the game is uh, uh, Samar here is um, uh, can swap spirits. Um, spirits are actually uh, beings from another dimension, and sometimes they cross over, and there's sort of an agreement between. Uh, uh, this dimension and the dimension of the spirits to like if you find a spirit you know um, put them back together and then send them back uh, and you can maybe also see that in the, the animations a little bit um, and then you know send yeah. them back to the other dimension but uh, there's something happening where there are a lot of spirits around right now and um, th that is one aspect of the story you know not to <laughs> spoil anything but also um, 
uh, but I guess sort of the the flow of the narrative is um, kind of uh, like Hades. Um, it's not necessarily a you know linear thing, but as you visit your friends, uh, the story develops and um, you you know gain uh, it's, you might gain some new spells, new furniture, uh, or nice. just have a very interesting uh, conversation with your friends. Um, and uh, yeah, so you and continue to progress in the game. Get get more. You get you get it, it gets you get, it's more interesting. You add more <laughs> elements to the game as you as you progress, which is great. I mean, I like I love that. But it doesn't it doesn't feel uh, what I call um, like stressful or like right. there's there, there's no sort of build up of like oh I got to get this thing done right now. You just right. I don't know. I'm just I'm trying to swap these things as fast as possible on this tiny ass <laughs> <Yeah>. screen. <laughs> only, here, only Justin would find a, find a way to make this game. Yeah. <laughs> I can't. I, like I can't stop from being competitive. I need to get these yeah. hearts. No, I'm just kidding. That's, that's actually something we've uh, we've win. come across. Yeah, like even though you can uh, go at your own pace in chill mode, um, we do have other modes that will scratch that itch if you need something fast and frenetic. <laughs> so, <laughs> All right. All right, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I kind of went a little bit in on it. Um, and, uh, did you, so you said we that have a two-player mode, which. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I was about to say, I was going yeah. to say. You just put it down on your friends. Okay. I see yeah. It. I see it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you don't want us to go in. We would, we'd mess up this whole interview. If this, <laughs> we wouldn't even be talking to you. It'd just be going in. Um, you said you could get furniture? Like, so you could build out your, like your apartment or house or how, yeah, how does so that work? That's yeah. awesome. So, uh, Samar, uh, so it's kind of the day-to-day -day, uh, life of Samar, and um, it, you'll start in Samar's room, you know, prep for the day. Um, you can ch put on new clothes if you want, um, and also in your nice. room you can decorate it um, uh, with different furniture, and uh, depending on what you have in your room, uh, it will affect gameplay as well. Um, ah, okay. Yeah. Nice. You guys added some really interesting elements to the game that that are not, you know, standard that you would think of a a game like this. But that's that's a, that's really interesting. Um, beyond that, like like wh why this specific color palette and like uh, mm -hmm. for the game? Um, it's like it's artistic, the choices. Yeah, the artistic choices. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think uh, early, in early development. Um, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Alex had um, uh, drawn some inspirations from their uh, from their home, and there and there's a certain color palette that is similar to this uh, that they uh, wanted in. Uh, particularly, I believe these this blue uh, is a is a particular mm -hmm. blue that uh, Alex wanted in, um, and yeah, and I think just in general and some. Currently, we do uh, in this demo. There's this, but as you see, other may see other scenes in the future. I think we did just want colorfulness in general, um, just to you know evoke you know joy <laughs> rather than uh, yeah ra rather than any kind of. It's uh, not uh, it's yeah. not gloom and doom, dark right. darkness right. of space. <laughs> mm -hmm. right. So la I have one last question. So what is um, like? it seems like this game is very inclusive it's very colorful how are you invoking that like the diversity in this game yeah um i would say um our team <laughs> um I, I i mentioned that a lot of this is like uh our our team putting themselves in the game and uh yeah our team is uh a very di diverse group um uh and and i think through that and maybe even directly in some of the characters, <laughs> which maybe self inserts in some ways. Um, uh, That's great. Uh, I, I think that really comes through. And I mean, it's just us kind of putting ourselves in <laughs> and wanting to see. Uh, and and I think also there are you know other kids, <laughs> kids, other people, <laughs> maybe kids, um, <laughs> who uh, <laughs> um, you know want to see people like us in games and for sure know, definitely it, do it feels yeah, like a, a do. excellent way to do that 
we appreciate you jumping on chris this is it's been amazing and i you know i've been following the game i've been trying to support it through like the the black game developer fund and that type of thing um how could we find out more about the game do you have any release date updates or um Yeah. yeah that type of thing um, yeah, so um, release date, uh, the plan is Q4 uh, 2022, uh, later this year. Um, awesome. And if you want to follow development, uh, at Softknot Week on Twitter is uh, nice. a, a great place to start. And we also have a, a Discord uh, for uh, following development as well, if you want to uh, get to know even more details about what's going on. Um, also, um, yeah, uh, we'd appreciate it if you wish list wish list us on Steam and also uh, uh, maybe also follow us on Itch.io. Uh, you can also get the demo there uh, on both uh, Steam and Itch.io uh, if you wanna. If anyone out there wants to play it, awesome. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Chris, and we'll definitely talk to you again uh, soon. Um, definitely wish list the game. Absolutely. Wish this a game. Buy the game Q4. It will be released. And play the demo. Play the demo. Yeah. yeah it's, it's dope. You'll love the vibe of that game. Yeah. Uh, Chris, so dope. Uh, yeah. It's great that, that they were able to jump on. Shout out to our sponsors. Again, Raw Fury, PlayStation, Razor, and everybody who's watching the stream and the developers involved. Um, coming up next is Haboka. A single-player survival horror video game based on folklore. For I don't know why I said video game. It's obvious it's a, it's a video <laughs> game. From Madagascar and set around the middle of the 20th century from Salem and his team at Flying Carpet Games. Let's check out the trailer. Check it out. That was the eerie trailer for Hoboka. Uh, we have Salem on the line. What is up, Salem? How's it going? Hi, guys. How are you guys doing? Good. I can't see your chin. Oh. I'm just okay. <laughs> and now I can see your chin. Just <laughs> I'm just playing. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Did you just shave too? I don't know. Now I'm like all about the facial yeah, features. I did, I did shave uh, yesterday just for you guys. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I shave for you too. Why, why are you um, this, this person? I, I can't. Right yo, now? I have to call it how it is. You know, this is live now because I'm talking this mess. Um, yeah, Hoboka <laughs> is, is, is so awesome. Thank you for joining us. I think you're, you know, what's really yeah. interesting is your story and where you're from. So I kind of want to, before we kind of, before we get into gameplay, can you, can you talk about a little bit about your background as a developer and where you're actually at, where, you know, um, what country and, and region you're from? Yeah. So I'm uh, Canadian. I'm from uh, Montreal. Uh, my mother is from Madagascar. So uh, you can see how uh, that plays into the game. Uh, my, my father is French Canadian. Uh, I've been in the gaming industry and since 2008, I started at Gameloft in, uh, you know, making a mobile game. Uh, and then I realized that I wanted to make my own games. I wanted to, I wanted to be indie. So in 2012, I started to, uh, my own studio, Flying Carpets Game. Um, we did, uh, a first video game, the, the girl and the robot. That you can maybe you can get see here that was released on ps4 and also on steam um, also on wii u if you guys remember the wii u <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then um uh, we did a card game and uh, now i'm back in video game uh, making my second video game which is a game that is a little bit more personal because it it goes into uh, the culture from uh, my mother's side of the family 
So uh, the inspiration came a lot from the story she told me. Sure, uh, and then right. I started, you know, to, uh, to research about the mythology, about folklore of Madagascar. And I, I discovered some pretty dark <laughs> things. Uh, you know, there was some good thing, but there's a lot of, um, you know, um, things linked to the underworld and, uh, and uh, death. And so it, it kind of tied in with the story I wanted to tell of grief. Um, so, um, yeah, basically in the game you play, you can play as two characters. The first one, uh, well, the one that is playable now is Alexander, uh, which um, just lost his mother and he's trying to find a way uh, to reconnect with her, uh, with, you know, the, the, uh, the, you can say the, the means of um, Malgashi um, witchcraft. So, uh, Hiboka, the word Hiboka is one of the word that means underworld in, uh, in Malgashi uh, culture. And so he's trying to find uh, the gate that connects the world of the living and the world of the dead. And uh, oh. the second character, Ramala, is a Malagashi girl that is caught in um, this story because of circumstances and uh, is caught because of Alexander's action inside uh, this mansion that is hidden deep in the woods of Madagascar. And so there's uh, what you play as two characters and there's a lot of uh, ethical choice that you have to, do, to, uh, to make. There's a lot of uh, puzzles, uh, uh, but basically, um, Alexander is trying to go deeper into the mansion to find this gate to the underworld, and Ramallah is trying to uh, escape <laughs> this uh, this mansion of horror. So basically, that's that's a little bit of the setup of both character. What's interesting is that uh, you play both character in on the same timeline timeline, but the action that you make as one character affects uh, the the consequences of another character. So once you play with that character. So you're going to be switching between two characters and decisions that you make stay consistent uh, within uh, the, the timeline of the other character. So for example, if you take something as one character or if, if you break something or if you leave a door open, then when you play as a, a second character, all those things are going to remain uh, as is in the world. So that's a little bit of the the, the unique selling point of this game. Uh, if you guys remember, if you played whole game like Resident Evil 1, where you play both character, when you play as one character and then the second, everything is perfectly closed, locked, and you have yeah. to replay in an alternate uh, kind of uh, similar world. But for this game, every, th every action that you make is going to uh, stay persistent uh, in that persistent state as you switch between two characters. So that's uh, so, basically so. Oh, I was just going to say, so as you you're switching them um, like in different parts of the story or as you like if you beat the game and then you play or you replay it, it maintains the integrity of what happened before. So basically, yeah, there, there is three chapter, a chapter for Alexander, a chapter for Ramallah and then a final chapter where uh, you alternate between the, the two characters. But so uh, when you play as Alexander, you're going to make decisions, some of them ethical decisions, because, um, and that's also going to affect, you know, the path that you're going to take at the ending. And then when you switch to the second chapter as Ramallah, then those, all the action, the consequences uh, of those oh, actions are going to remain. If that makes sense. No, that totally makes sense. I, I felt a rumbling feature on the controller as the, as yeah, the, there is the door slid by. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait, what? Um, that's, you, that's you can interesting. see that uh, we're, it's still early. There's no UI yet. Like you were, we're using the, the default uh, Unity UI um, text based. So, but uh, yeah, so now we're working on this first section of the mansion, which is ba basically the, the main hall, the basement, and also the dungeon. 
could you talk a little bit as we still play um number yeah, one is he going in the right is he doing the right thing <laughs> you know, you have to go go back <laughs> yeah, I'm, doing I'm doing i know what i'm doing <laughs> you gotta listen he said he said go back go back yeah and also you can run uh if you hold down the, the x button i believe if you, if you have an xbox controller it's either the x button the, yeah there you go uh to the right there's a there should be a door on the right side of that room yeah, if you turn, turn right again. On the right side of here? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah just... <laughs> You're running to the corner. <laughs> I can't say anything because if I was playing, you would clown me the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Um, right. Could you talk a little bit about your team? And you could, you could interrupt and just jump in and tell them where to go, too. But, uh, sure, sure. Yeah, take, take that rope. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, fleet text there, but it's okay. Um, so my team is a little bit scattered all over the world. Um, one of the main people, person that, that stayed with me with my first game is Ayaka Nakam Nakamura, who is based in Japan. So yeah, you can attach the rope here and you have to go back near the throne to put, um, there should be a lever near the throne. If you go back, no, not that way, the other way. Not the other way. <laughs> Yeah, this should be a tron. Like, just go for it. Oh, and yeah, the, uh, yeah. the lever up here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right there. Yeah. The the and puzzle elements are really cool. It's interesting. Yeah. So you attach and then again press it again. So Ayaka is based in, J in Japan. She's the one doing the, the concept art and also all the promo promotional art for the game. Uh, of course, me, myself, I'm uh, taking care of the design, the programming, and uh, obviously the, the production, uh, a little bit of um, level art as well. Um, then we have uh, Mark Choi, who's based in um, uh, London. He's the one doing the composition, the music composition. Um, we have Ahmed, who is uh, also in Montreal. Uh, he's doing the sound. Uh, we have um, uh, Stephanie Landry that does the character modeling. So uh, I'm pretty much the one uh, full time on this, but uh, and other member come in and out uh, to do their job, and uh, I'm. Uh, the one integrating everything uh, into the game. Uh, so yeah, we're pre pretty much um, scattered all over the world. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. that's cool. What were what were some of the lessons you learned from your first game that you brought over to developing this game? Because I know there must be <laughs> there must be a ton, right? <laughs> there is um, a ton of, of lesson. Um, I guess the the the, the main one is. Uh, uh not rush into it like um i i have more of a philosophy of uh you know it's going to be finished when it's going to be finished uh i want to put more you know care and attention into into this uh oh you have to go back to the chess oh did you get the the match yeah he got it okay yeah. you got it okay yeah, yeah. so go back to the candle near the table to the right, yeah. So, yeah, perfect. And uh, here, in case you missed it, I can give you the solution. You have to take the, the knife on the right side, if you move with the D-pad, yeah. D -pad, yeah. Is it working? Yeah, so take one of the knife and put one on the chest. Oh, wow. This is really and gruesome. One on the right hand, uh, the right, right arm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That. And one on the left uh, leg. Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, no, left leg. Please. Oh, the left leg. Okay. Yeah, you can take it back. Yeah, take it. Yeah. 
I thought he said. I thought you said left neck too. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> I'm just playing. <laughs> I got a left neck. Yeah, left neck. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. That, no, that, he like. Go back. To, go back. Go back. Go back. Go back the other way. Yeah, this should be a device right there. On, right oh on wow. Right. Uh, no, go back. Uh, yeah, to the left, to the right. Yeah, go there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Exactly. That's that's interesting. So, what are your? Obviously, this has some survival horror influences. What are some of your main influences for this game and other games that your studio is developing? Well. Uh, I've always been a fan of the Silent Hill uh, series and uh, oh, okay. Fatal Frame. So, um, uh, in terms, uh, and of course, Resident Evil. So, those are were my main inspiration. Uh, but in terms of um, storytelling, uh, a lot of it from is from like uh, puzzle game from like Zero Escape series and things like that. Uh, it, it, it's less uh, there's less action it's more about the puzzles about uh, you know in the the vein of escape room and stuff like that but there is a little bit uh, of action oh that's yeah, so going interesting i haven't played the zero escape series that's i gotta check that out now yeah it's really good yeah you're going the right way yeah So what are some of the challenges that you faced, you know, um, developing this game? Um, there is challenge, but I would say it's, it's kind of challenge that are fun to overcome. So a lot of it yeah. is uh, research, you know, to, to make sure that I have uh, in terms of like uh, finding out monster, like for example, you'll see a monster uh, soon. Um, a lot of that information is um, not written down on uh, in documents. So uh, a lot of the work w was to like interview people, um, you know, families on, you know, uh, stuff like that. And if it is documented in books, it's usually very uh, hard to find on, on the internet. So I had to like hunt down um, <laughs> on the internet. Like You had to go to the uh, library? I had to go to the library, <laughs> stop wow. playing video game, and actually, wow. you know, open a book and uh, you know order books that are that have like one print left in the world or <laughs> things like that. Uh, like for example, here here's a, a monster called the Kinoli, which uh, is a monster that uh, which that used to be human but was possessed by a, a human uh, evil human spirit for such a long time that they changed their appearance changed to, to, to something like this or a creature with very not long nails and um, that's cool i can imagine uh just the discovery um during your research would be quite fun especially during development and it's like real, like real history that you're digging into. It seems really interesting. Where can we find out more about the game? When is when are you uh, anticipating release? And and where can we follow you in the game? This game's dope. So uh, you can. Uh, I really recommend you guys to follow our mailing list on our website, which is flyingcarpetsgames.com. So you should be able to, um, you know, register to our mailing list. There's, we're also on um, uh, on Steam uh, wish list if you want to wish list to us. So we're gonna send information updates through uh, Steam and also through our mailing list. So those would be the the two uh, main way to to get uh, to follow us. Uh, of course, our Twitter is is a good place as well. Uh, in terms of our plan, uh, I would really like us to be able to uh, do a Kickstarter either this year or the start of next year. Uh, 
like I said, I, I want to put as much care as possible into this game. The, the demo that you saw today is maybe like 15% uh, of the game, but um, nice. I, I would really like to, to finish this game within uh, two years or something like that. Uh, uh, but again, you know, learning from my past game, I, I, I want to, to come in uh, with the philosophy philosophy of it's going to be finished when it's going to be uh, finished and uh, not rush things and make nice. put the, as much care into it as possible because uh, it is personal uh, kind of personal and also uh, it reflects a, a culture that is not usually uh, presented in game and so I want uh, to uh, to be as accurate and as as careful as possible when I, when the, the game is released. Cool. Thank you so much, Salem. We appreciate you. Yeah. This is, this is Thank great. you. Thank you so much for having me. Stunning. It's a beautiful game. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right. All right. Talk to you later. That, that was dope. Like, you're really into those games. Yeah, you're like really into those style of games. Yeah, and yeah, got the puzzles. You already knew the puzzles. You were just like memorizing all the puzzles. <laughs> That's, it's hilarious. I was like struggling when I first tried it. I actually would have benefited more from him walking me through it. Um, but yeah, that was that was really awesome. Haboka, go ahead and wish list that. That is on the Mix Steam page right now as we speak. Up next, we have an award-winning producer and developer, Des Gale, who is a founder of POC and Play, been in the industry for 23 years, worked at Xbox EA independently on his own games and helps developers at publishing studio, fellow traveler, and so much more. Des will be sharing his game Hellbrand. And we do have a little piece of, uh, what is it? Uh, we have a little animatic, an amazing animatic. And then we're going to be playing an early build of the game. Awesome. Check it out. That was incredible. Must have been 20 of them. No, at least 30. Unbelievable. But why do you let them live? They are just villagers. There's no honor in that. But we haven't seen the action this whole journey. We're trying to fight. Fear not. There is plenty of fight for you in here. This will stop any unwanted guests from coming from behind. Oh, man. There's just one guy in here. There is nothing for you here. Please leave. Oh, just a woman. To hide here of all places. Genius. Welcome home, Friedrich. Can we attack? Yes. Formation six? Formation six. the boy why are you doing this I am a soldier I serve the crown it is on the wrong head that is not up to me do not be a fool I taught you better than this better foolish than blind <laughs> where is the boy even if you get through me you'll never find him you could be right. Then leave! Yeah. You're still a strong fighter, but age has got the best of you. Hmm. Maybe I won't need to find him. Maybe he'll come to me. No! You fool. <laughs> okay, it's okay. There we go. Hidden in plain sight. Impressive magic. You cannot do this. You know she will kill him. You may as well leave him here with me. He will never forgive you for this. This is for you. 
It's a shame the circumstances weren't different. That was the animatic for Hellbrand. We have Dez on the line. It looks really interesting. It's yeah. it's cool to see stuff uh, so early. You know Definitely. what I mean, especially yeah. story based narrative. You there, Dez? I am. Hello. Yo, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks. Um, it's, it's really funny. What's the animatic again? Um, yeah, we have we have looked at it internally for like a good three or four months now. Um, but uh yeah, it's a good asset to help us like uh pitch for funding. Um yeah, that's yeah, pretty cool. <laughs> I th I think that that's even like a, a good like way to start. I mean, because you have we have an early build of the game, you have the animatic. There's so much actually I would love to talk to you about because you have such a wealth of knowledge and you're a veteran in the space. Can we like let's just get started with a little bit of your history i mean i because but you know before prepping for this and i know i've known you for a bit i mean just through talking a few times and looking at some of your interviews it's crazy what you have accomplished so i kind of want to have the the audience hear some of that can you t tell us a little bit about your 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 background in the industry cool yeah absolutely um oh man so yeah, I started a long time ago, uh, 1998, I got my first job with Lego, before they were cool, um, we were making games like Lego <laughs> Race, well, that's, Lego Races was actually pretty good, um, on the, on the PS1, um, and then we did like Lego, uh, Lego Lad, Lego Creator on, on, uh, PC, uh, and a couple of, uh, Game Boy games actually, which was, which were pretty cool, um, yeah, after that, uh, I went to Microsoft for a little bit, helped launch the original Xbox. Um, that was a very intense time, um, but still good. Uh, where'd I go from there? There, I went to EA after that for five years. Um, yeah, that was awesome. Like, you know, worked on pretty much every EA Sports title under the sun. Um, then I left there, went into sort of like smaller development. Um, Still working on EA games, which is which is kind of funny. Um, popped over to Barcelona for a bit, made some mobile games for Adidas. Uh, then I then I went home, and what did I do? Oh yeah, I went to work for Climax on a game um, that got killed by Square. And then, um, in a, just to show how small the industry is and a bizarre twist of fate, I ended up working for Square. Uh, with the two people that actually killed my previous game, so um, that was oh, a wow. fun uh, interview. That's crazy. That, that, it, it, it was cool. Like the game was ambitious, and uh, honestly, yeah, we weren't getting there. Like it could have ended better, but um, objectively, it was the right decision. Like you know, there's no beef there. Um, and then yeah, that's when I switched into sort of like indie publishing. So I. Uh, what did I do? So yeah, I was a producer on Life is Strange, the original uh, series. Then I moved on to Just Cause 4, I think. Yeah, 3, 4, one of them. Um, and then after that, yeah, I moved into publishing with the uh, collective team. That was cool. Uh, published some really nice games. And then uh, after that, I came over here, built a house. Yeah, and then um, I started working with Fellow Traveller um, two and a half years ago. Yeah, focusing on narrative games, which is great because that's kind of like uh, the core for me. Um, yeah, that's it's awesome. That that's so. I mean, you're like super OG, triple OG status, and I don't think <laughs> I don't think people know that. That's that's crazy. <laughs> um, so so you're working with a fellow traveler, and you're you're developing prototypes in uh, various different games. Um, which kind of brings us to Hellbrand. You want to jump into describing Hellbrand and maybe help help alfonso out um and he's gonna he's gonna yeah. hit me real soon if i keep clowning him so yeah you need to walk back and come out the river uh that's right and then go where are you yes yeah, so you go back to the main path yeah you go over the bridge you'll be fine yeah um so the help brand yeah uh 
the Hell Brand, as you can see, is like an action RPG, and it kind of follows the story of uh, this fallen king. So um, you made a deal with the devil that you'd stay in hell as long as your son was alive, and um, that animatic is kind of like the path to your son not being alive. Um, so you get released from hell, and um, basically you're on a journey of vengeance. Um, you want to find out what happened, and... Uh, you know, retrieve your son's body. Um, but the devil makes you another deal. She's just like, oh, hey, tell you what, if you bring his body back to me, I'll bring it back to life. But I need you to get this ancient artifact for me. So, um, yeah, you travel the sort of like, the world doesn't have a name yet, but you go to these different places and you need to collect um, uh, graces, which are a mixture of powers and different armor that you used to have back when you were outside of hell um because you're gonna need it to take down the big bad at the end um the the little wrinkle here is those graces are protected by guardians um who are a mixture of um mythical creatures that have been imbued with godlike powers uh to help them protect it um yeah yeah it's good fun um, cool, cool. are we d d does this current build have like music or, or sound just i'm just curious no, no. to make sure that we no. have everything yeah audio okay cool, cool. i just want to um, make sure okay, okay uh, cool yeah we had some problems with optimization so like the, the, the file like with the audio in the file size is like huge um yeah we're not quite sure what we did there no that uh, totally that totally makes sense where are you uh, guys oh, where are you at oh. with development oh go ahead sorry yeah once, once again sorry, sorry if you go back to that gate um to the mm -hmm. yeah if you go all the way back um oh what's it i think it's left bumper or right bumper you can uh, cast fire magic and okay. you should open the gate um and if that doesn't work ah, I, I can tell you somewhere else um where are we at so we've no just come to the end of uh this proof of concept so we we're very lucky um we applied so yeah sorry no no on oh, the sick. yeah so you need to talk to the green character if you press uh, what's the controller B, uh, have you got yeah good, um, yeah he'll ask you to light the brazier and then that's when you press that fire attack and it should light. Um, okay. So yes, yeah, so we got concept funding, um, which is literally just to write a design doc from the the state. There we go. Okay, that didn't work. Um, if you come a little bit back down the path. Mm -hmm. And then now come round to your, like, to your, if you uh, turn right, no, not your right, my left, that's it, yeah. And then, there we go, go through there. <laughs> go through the, the, sorry, the opposite way. Sorry, I'm, I'm, this is the camera's weird. Yeah, no, yeah. Um, the other side of the path. You just go that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. keep, keep, just, right. go, just go down. I'm just going yeah. back down. Oh, back. yeah, down. Go down, 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 down and then yeah, go yeah, right. Sorry. And then turn right, turn right. Um, right, oh, right. The characters. Right. Right now, on, turn left, the character right. left <laughs> okay. up through this gap here. That's it. There, you go. there we go. Now go no, no, get through that gap. This gap. Yep. Yep. Keep this going. One? This is the okay. best. Yeah. This is now, the worst. Now go up on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> cool. There we go. Keep going. You'll find a path down there that will let you into town. Um, so yeah. Sorry. So yes, yeah, so we've been working on this for um, uh, nine months. Uh, yeah, it is the proof of concept that we uh, are going to use to pitch for further funding. Nice. That's cool. That's this cool. Is, this is beautiful. Yeah, like, it's the cool. game is visually stunning. I think this is like so. So for all the audience out here, like we just got this a couple days ago. So it's it's actually awesome to see like builds like early. So I I can't front on if I was doing the same thing, I would be going like in the middle in into trees and walls and everything else. So um <laughs> it's, that's hilarious i think it was uh right. what is it oh really okay yeah not, not to the right but like into town the other way yeah oh, no, oh, no. oh. well that's not good yeah. all right we'll this is the problem of live streams oh no yeah you got uh, fumbled up uh if you've we, got a keyboard we need a reset. You, you press page up and you can teleport um if you have a keyboard oh, okay. um yeah we'll just reset Sorry. we'll just reset it it's cool okay. no no it's all it's okay. all good all right. can you talk about like so you said you had some funding for oh you got it he got it i think 
um so you said you got some funding for like the to to put together the game design document and and um the the pre preliminary document <laughs> this dude is like falling down uh mount like mountains like crazy this is ridiculous oh, i think we should just reset it uh, honestly yeah let's just let's go let's go two up two up you know what i mean okay yeah two up reset you know what I mean? <laughs> um, this is great sorry, so the the funding yeah so the german government um they're, they're really committed to uh like raising german game developers um on the world stage uh so there's kind of two tiers you've got the main sort of like federal government funding um which has one pot of like x millions and then each state has its own different funding pots as well which um they go up to about half million in some places it's very similar to the canadian media fund um which is very cool so you've got a concept stage which you can ask for uh twenty thousand euros and that's literally you write a design doc uh do some concept art um which we did uh and then after that you can apply for follow-on funding which for us would uh, they call it um prototype funding which we've used to create this, this proof of concept here um and that go we got eighty thousand for that um which is cool but eighty thousand disappears very very quickly um yeah people yeah, yeah some people don't realize how how costly even making like prototypes is you know so it's 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 interesting can you talk a little bit about your philosophy on raising funds because you when i've talked to you uh previously you have a very interesting you know way of going about it right and and kind of mitigating your risks yeah so it's a, it's, it's oh man it's kind of frustrating so for me personally like my risk profile is very high like i think you know video games you know they're definitely an art form and some games whilst they aspire to be commercial like i don't think that's always the end goal um so i um, oh man, how did you do that? You were literally... Oh man, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, what we tend to do is like before, like the, we, we got the funding here, is we do a little bit of work for hire, um, screw away a little bit of money, and then we just work on you know some, some concepts and prototypes. Um, there is a little bit of like market analysis where we're just like okay these types of games we definitely shouldn't do um you know and it's it's, it's sad actually because i've done my favorite type of game like you know 3d platformers but it, they're very difficult to sell if your name is nintendo um yeah and then uh specifically for us like because we're heavily story based you know i i tend to come up with the the vision and the core story arc like oh this is kind of what i want to do and then um that's when i bring on like <laughs> proper writers uh and they they make it not terrible um and then yeah like with this pro this proof of concept here like this actually bucked my trend a little bit because i prefer to sort of like have all the environment just all gray boxed and then just focus on the control uh the camera and the, the character but um uh, this could sound really negative, but it isn't. But as part of the funding, like you have to hire from specific places in Germany. Um, and basically we just play to the strengths of the people that we could find. Um, so yeah, that's what kind of skewed the, the prototype slightly. Um, but then, yeah, in general with funding, like obviously the goal is to try and get as much free money as possible. Um, so, you know, grant funds first and then speak to platform holders and then if you still need money after that, uh, that's when you start talking to publishers. Um, you know, because each each terms, you know, just get less and less attractive. Uh, yeah, that's that's super interesting. I don't know if this is where he's supposed to go, but it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, um, you're right. Now. You're, you're in, yes, it's good. <laughs> oh, okay, that was really good because I was I was just looking at how everyone was doing. Uh, that's that's really funny. Um, uh, one of the questions I, I so you've worked with publishers, you work with big AAA companies. In what ways have uh, working for a publisher influenced 
your growth as a developer and a leader in the industry and your path? Oh, cool. Um, I guess uh, knowing what sort of like internally the, the processes are. So um, when you when you're making the pitch materials, um, you know, focusing on some areas over other areas, um, and knowing you just have to be specific. So uh, publicly, like some publishers are very clear about what they want and what their labels are about. Um, others aren't so much; it's a bit more difficult. But um, the conversations just happen much more faster when you do that. Um, and also, uh, the biggest thing is not to assume. I mean, you know, unless you're in the upper echelon of of, of superstardom, um, don't assume that who you're pitching to knows who you are and what you've done. Like, always be you know clear about going mm -hmm. over that again. Um, and then, and some of this is just kind of. Um, you know, direct insider knowledge is that sometimes there's just budgets around where they've just got to spend the money. Um, sadly for me, it doesn't always line up the types of games that we make, but um, yeah, you know, budgets, you know, they're annual and they need to be, you know, they need to be um, allocated, otherwise you don't get them again next year. Um, yeah, and then I think the biggest thing is just knowing that, you know, there's always more than one person you need to convince. Um, Pretty much mm -hmm. every publisher I've had contact with, um, you know, you, you meet the person, like the scout or, or, or the biz dev person. Uh, but after that, like, you know, there's four or five other people they got convinced internally uh, before they give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. So, uh, yep, there's that. And the main thing is just patience, like seeing it from the inside. Like, I know how long things take. Um, you know, it's not going to be a week or two. Sometimes it could be six or even eight. Um, but that depends on how much they like your game, right? Like if everyone likes the game, they'll move as fast that's as they true. want. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's an interesting thing that I've, I've like encountered too. I've also encountered cause I, I do stuff in publishing too. The la even though the game is dope as hell, even if like, if a developer is impatient, it kind of puts people off. It's like, yo, just relax a bit you know just wait it out we're i'm trying to help help you i'm trying to work with you and that that kind of that could also turn publishers off i've i've um yeah i've witnessed people talk themselves out of a deal and you're just like holy shit all you just gotta do is can i swear on here no, right. yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no yeah you can um, yeah 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 all you gotta do is just like you know shut the f up and uh you'll be all right but yeah some people yeah <laughs> yeah it's hilarious yo yeah. thank you des uh this game is dope man yeah the game yeah. it's really cool to see this early on thank you for sharing it with us yeah. and thanks for joining us we get we have to have another longer inform like another conversation because you have so much information we just have to chop it up but uh where can we find out more about hellbrand um Cool. Um, so yeah, we're mainly on Twitter. A little bit quiet at the minute, but um, uh, that's on uh, Hidden Titan De. Um, mainly shouting there. Uh, the Steam page is up, so you can wish this to game right now, please. Um, and then yeah. for me, like I'm at Kid Desimo on, on on Twitter. If you want to see me, mainly shit post and occasionally talk about the game. That's a, that's <laughs> hilarious. Uh, cool. Thank you so much, Des. I think we're gonna go into a short break. And then um, we're going to come back with a, a friend of ours, John Davis, from Black Sheep Consulting. So thank you so much, Des. Thank you. Yeah, Cheers. for sure, for sure. All right.
and we're back. Yeah, Dez's game is 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 amazing. You did a great job because that was like one of the first times you've tried that and uh, fell off a cliff a, a couple times, but made things happen. Next up, we got. I'm not even giving you a chance to, so to rebuttal. You know what I mean? So much shit. <laughs> I was looking at Mary back there. She was like, "What the hell is this guy doing?" Uh, but I wouldn't have done any better. Um, so up next, or up right now, what am I talking about? John Davis, co-founder of Bit Summit, Black Sheep Consulting. He does so many things. He's on the line. What's up? What's going on? What's up? What's up? How are you doing, man? What's going man? on? Uh, man, I'm hanging in there, man. I've been, I had to get up pretty early. It's like uh, 6 a.m. in Tokyo right now. So, uh. Oh, I was wow. fortunate. My Thanks my daughter was like she 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 woke me up at four. She was like, "Daddy, you have a you have a meeting <laughs> at five. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. She's your assistant already. I know, right? <laughs> that's cool. How you guys no, but doing? it's How's it's that? it's really. Sorry, there's a little, there's a tiny, there's a little bit of a delay. So like, I think we'll have to just maybe leave a little a pregnant pause. Um, okay, we'll have to but, we'll have uh, to be we'll have to be like the uh, the uh, uh, you know that guy on the scene that the you know for whenever he's reporting you know from overseas is just waiting just sitting there. You that's what it's like. I have to yeah, have my just sitting there for a second. <laughs> yeah, just like this. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, um, but no, it, it's awesome to have you on you know on board. I've been trying to have you like on one of the Black Voices of Gaming for a minute. You know, but then I cut like the last time I, I caught COVID right when we were supposed to do a stream, which was unfortunate, you know, um, but it's great to have you here. I mean, you're such you're so influential in the in the space with Bit Summit, your work at previous convention stuff. I know I'm blowing you up, but you you have to toot your own horn a little bit. Uh, can you just talk about like the, the thing because you have black sheep? Uh, consulting and you're you're producing you're working on a lot of different games with a lot of folks and, and also it's not easy to get in line with and in tune with um folks you know japanese developers and publishers like that's something you have to really work your way up to so can you talk a little bit about your journey yeah 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 so um my kind of origin story was, you know, I, I came out to Japan to teach English, uh, and and with under the auspices that I would I would kind of uh, freelance, you know, uh, in journalism, mm -hmm. and um, that was right before that was like around two thousand four, you know, so it was a few years before the the whole kind of world kind of crashed with the, the Great Recession, and uh, um, and I was just here kind of freelancing a little bit for IGN for for and stuff, met some nice people. And um, and kind of slowly worked my way through journalism into helping out um, game devs here and helping out you know um, publishers here and things like that, which led to me working at like Grasshopper Manufacturer, um, working at Q Games, mm -hmm. and at Q Games uh, I, I worked with uh, James Milky to to start Bit Summit. Nice. That's dope. Like, how did that? How did you start? Because you know, when I, when we first met, I did not know that you originally started with James. And I love James too. Like, he's gonna be here in the in the city. I think he's gonna be DJing and playing music, which is which is crazy. How did you guys like come together and and start Form Bit Summit? Well, we kind of ran in the same circle. I mean, the 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 foreigners that work in games here in Japan is very small. You know, small group of us, and and we we you know had a lot of friends in common and um and right after i joined q games you know we went out for lunch and he was like hey i'm leaving q entertainment <laughs> to come work at q games <laughs> and uh the two of us were there and we had just finished um i think shipping a pixel jump 4 a.m and um and we had some free time and he was like hey let's 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 do a convention and i was kind of like well, what are you talking about you know like what do you want to do and he's like i want to do something <laughs> a little bit different than then you know your typical typical stuff i'm gonna like do something that really highlights japanese indies here um and yeah we we got together with uh with tommy san uh, uh one of the producers at, at q and and just kind of started brainstorming and had our first event like maybe six months after that we had about 200 people you know uh total um it was it was dope though because you know famitsu came out um, um we had 
IGN came out. We had a lot of people um, from from overseas that showed us love, you know, thanks to the strength of of Q and Milky, and uh, and it it was really kind of the springboard to to making the show a lot bigger. And, and it's just every year. It's been just like just like you guys. This is our tenth year anniversary here for Bit Summit. So you know, it's it's uh, crazy. it's kind of been a, a blessing. You know, I didn't imagine it would yeah, happen. Yeah, it's definitely. Like this. It's crazy. It's like, you know, going to Bit Summit is definitely a destination event that everyone should go to. And it's just like, I love going. It, it sucks the two years that, I, that we couldn't uh, do anything or we couldn't go out because I, I missed going out there. It's like in the in Kyoto. It's it's just gorgeous. So, you know, definitely props on that. I know you were writing some notes, so you want to jump no, in? No. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I want to know is like, how did you how do you find other devs of color community? Obviously, in Japan, there's not, you know, like a, a plethora of black people there. So, <laughs> so how are you connecting with with folks? Uh, it's it's like I said, very small community. So anybody that that works in game dev here, you know, a dev of color here, you know, we or we'll run into each other. Unfortunately, I've been stuck in this office for like the past two years. Um, and, and not really able to like get out and press the flesh and kiss the babies, you know, to really get to, to, to know people. But, but you, you kind of just run into the same folks at events, you know, people come to bit summit, they go to Tokyo Indies, they go to Kyoto Indies, these like, you know, kind of small community events. And, you know, you see, you see somebody and you just, you know, give them the, give them the, the, the nod, you know, the heads up and then, uh, you know, and try to build from there. Um, you know, my homie from, uh, that I've known for forever, um, Scott, Scott, uh, Burfer, Scott, well, Scott popular is his, his kind of, uh, his moniker, but you know, he, 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 uh, he, he started in, you know, just developing his own game kind of like in a, a very small sense. Um, and, and so you just kind of run into these people. Um, it's, it's not something that, that it's something you kind of actively have to do, you know, there's also Facebook groups, yeah. things like that. But uh, but yeah, there's definitely a very small small community here of uh, of game devs of color. Yeah, it seems to be this the the theme with a lot of the developers we talk to is that you have to build community, you have to connect with people, you have to make make an effort to like sort of like cultivate that network. And I, I think it people that are successful are the ones who are actually actively engaging with people, and and and, um, and not that you can't not be successful not doing that, but it just seems to like be a catalyst for it. Um, one of the other things I was like, wanted to like know about is like, I know the gaming scene is different in Japan. Um, and I, I heard it that you guys, they're still like straight up coin operated stuff. Like arcades don't exist here anymore. Like they just don't exist in, in the States. Is that still a thing there? Uh, game centers, arcades are, are, are not really a thing anymore like when i got here 18 okay. years ago you could still go down to uh to you know the corner and, and find game centers right like arcades and you know i go there and play marvelous capcom and and things like that um there but now they're just like just a really a few handful of places that are kind of really gd you know uh um uh fgc um kind of oriented fighting game community oriented so you know you have a place mm -hmm. a spot in shibuya you have a spot in you know ikebukuro or whatnot where people who are like are, are in the scene who want to you know fight other people are going to be there mm -hmm. otherwise it's okay. just just your your regular like kind of like photo booth stuff your your um mm -hmm. um like the more claws yeah gotcha ponds um i don't gotcha, know if yeah. david busters is still a thing in the states but but more event spaces oh, like yeah. that yeah <laughs> barely then, yeah, yeah. then really than arcades crazy. anymore i mean the <laughs> worldwide you know and that's that's quite kind of the thing for for bit summit this year is our 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 tagline is crossroads is that you know everything is is really shifted in the past i mean obviously in the past you know 10 20 years and, yeah. and then this year has been there's been it's just like this kind of sea change for the way that people interact and and um through games um so you don't have these like a lot of these physical spaces everybody has moved online um and it can be disconcerting you know for you know old heads like me you know um like where what are we supposed to do where do we go 
So we want to kind of like be an avenue for the Japanese devs here and also the devs that, you know, expat devs like myself uh, to be able to to navigate that space, that online space, but also be able to to be um, in an event physically, because I think it's important to be able to talk to people and, and you know, really present your personality in a, in a way that's not just a screen name. Um, so we have to like, there's just a little crossroads here right now that's going on in games and in, in I guess, the world in general um, that we're all trying to navigate, you know? Yes, that's interesting because, like, you know, just GDC, no one was coming to GDC. And then all of a sudden, a few, it, like, trickled down. It became this domino effect. Now everybody's coming to GDC because they just want to see p- people in person, uh, which is just an interesting phenomenon. Um, and actually, like, what you're talking about is, like, that's what I when I would go to Akubara, Akubara, I, I'm, I'm, I know I'm butchering Akihabara. that, but like every Akihabara. Yeah. See, I'm like sounding like it's like it's terrible. Middle Eastern or some shit. Um, it's terrible. Um, but I would always want to go to Electric City. That's my way of, of uh, not butchering it anymore um, and just play games against people, you know, and like just because I'm, I'm a big fighting game fan, obviously. Um, and just you know, even in Tokyo, like the the Taito Game Center and the Sega Game Center, mm-hmm. and from what I heard, a lot of those have been shutting down. But that was like a really good treat because they don't have those in person things here anymore. Um, yeah. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about like about uh, uh, about Black Sheep and what you've been? Because I would you know I would see you at PAX and you're like representing all of these different companies. You're doing production. Can you talk about kind of like what you've been doing in the uh, in in the game industry? Well, I left I left Q in I think 2015 maybe, and uh, because I was I was living I was living in Tokyo and working for them remotely, um, and uh, and I left Q to to work with the Mega Booth for a while. And when I started working with the Mega Booth, it just kind of became more of a consulting thing where I was helping them with all of their stuff in Asia, Indie Mega Booth, by the way. Um, and um, from there, it just kind of kind of naturally happened, you know, where I would I was helping other Japanese devs that were trying to, to get their games overseas and then, and then also helping any uh, devs from overseas that were trying to get their games into Japan. Just kind of like introducing people to the right folks, you know, working with publishers, mm-hmm. working with developers. Um, through BitSummit as well, I was going to, to different, you know, different countries, uh, you know, through our partnerships with other other events, you know, like The Mix or, or Indicate or um uh big in brazil um just just all these different places so it kind of kind of happened evolved naturally um like if you if you go and like look online for like black sheep or something like that my for my company like i don't have a web page or anything like that you know i'm pretty low-key i just i just uh just try to work with folks that work in projects that i like and 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 i've been fortunate enough to to uh to survive <laughs> off of that <laughs> no, I, no i feel that for sure that's it's very it's actually very similar to like the stuff that we're doing with black boys and gaming in the mix is like you just start to connect people to different places just naturally and like not really looking for a paycheck just just to help out the community you know at large and then it just so happens you get fit in you start to have these relationships kind of like us con- connecting and like hey let's do this maybe we could do this maybe we could do business together and it becomes this natural thing because you know you're you're so passionate about this space that it just naturally evolves so you're like making a living <laughs> making a yeah, living yeah, you know what yeah. i mean yeah i mean it, it's it's super i'm super fortunate super blessed about it you know like i like when i was going to mix events you know at, at PAX and, and GDC and linked up with you, you know, I remember we had lunch. We were like, all right, let's do something. And then, they, you know, like a year passed. And then I think I came out to E3 one year. And then like you gave me a big like shout out when you guys were like finishing the show. You're like, yeah, we're going to oh, do something. Yeah. Bit summit. I, I put you like, on blast. Like, oh, sweet. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And, uh, and then, and then we had you guys out. So it just kind of just, you know, you have to, to work with the people that are around you people that you feel like are, are, you know, good folks and, and kind of, um, uh, I don't know, it, it just evolves, right? It's, it's, I think we're all very fortunate to be working in this space and be working with something that we obviously have a passion for and love doing. 
and uh and and yeah hopefully it continues <laughs> I mean, we 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 survived yeah. a pandemic so yeah we made it i mean i think that one of the things that's super great about when we talk about community and building that community is the connections that um justin has done has built um with the black voices in gaming like all of these developers that we feature on this program um, are, are connected with each other. And I think that, that it's, it's building this really organic community that is, is really, really benefiting everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah I sure. ran into Des, um, like, like, and I think I met Des in like, in like Berlin, like, like a few years ago, <laughs> you know, like you just run into people in the, in like the hottest places, you know, um, but uh, but you gotta nurture those connections. I that would if if I had any advice for for any any game devs of you know of color or, or otherwise like like you have to kind of keep nurturing your connections with people um, and and don't burn bridges. Mm -hmm. You know just just uh, uh, cherish the relationship that you build because they will they will guide you in the future. You know that's my old man knowledge that's yeah no that's i mean that's a good way to take it out i was actually gonna bet i was about to ask you that question and i think it's really funny is because we were kind of talking ish like a couple weeks ago uh, uh weeks ago about some folks that we've talked with before and we're like damn i'm just trying to like talk to you or be cool with you and then you're like burning this bridge for no reason but it's like it kind of you know it creates this trajectory of like now i don't want to mess with these certain people so and I think also as black folks, we got to really make sure our reputation is sterling, you know, <laughs> it's like, see, you can't yeah, do that. You yeah. got to maneuver in such a way. Uh, this is interesting. But like, how can we find out more about you, uh, more about Bit Summit and the things that you're doing? Uh, yeah, um, I guess the, the best way would just be to go to bitsummit.org uh, for all game devs. Uh, you know, submissions are now open. Uh, they close on uh, April 15th. Um, and the show is going to be uh, August fifth uh, through the seventh um, of this year, and it's it's open to the public this year. So we're super happy about that. We're going to have one day of um, nice. just biz dev stuff, and then one day of public, um, where we're hoping and praying that there's not a big, you know, another big Omicron surge or another Omicron but COVID surge, and that will come kill travel again. Uh, but, yeah. uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're we want to have the mix out of course. Um, and, and as many game devs as possible, especially game devs of color, I want to, you know, say what's up to my people. So come out, enjoy the yeah, show, sure. have some drinks by the river sure. after the show and, uh, yeah, make some friends. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so we hope to come out soon. Um, but thanks so much, John. It was, it Thank was you. dope. So appreciate it. And we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. All right. All right. Peace. Dude, John is so is just it's so chill. dope. Chill. Yeah. yeah. Um, just making things happen. Next up, we have a developer. Uh, oh, he's still on there. Okay, great. Uh, <laughs> Clowny. Uh, we're going to be chatting with Yada Anderson um, from Synergia Games and play Eldoran. Uh, where you can explore a dangerous world and fight deadly creatures for untold treasure in this Lovecrafty-inspired action RPG game. Let's check out the trailer right now. That was the trailer for Eldoran. The game looks dope. dope. I actually was yeah. playing this game for hours while we were testing, um, and I got hooked. I love 
action RPGs and sprite based games uh, with amazing pixels. We have Yada on the line, and we're going to be playing Elderan, not Elder Rings. Um, so let's let's make it happen. What's up, Yada? Hey, what's up, guys? How's uh, it going? Yes, nice. I'm so so happy, so exciting. You know, thank you so much for D the opportunity to you know talk about this project. And I was watching the 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 other talk, and it was nice also to to hear. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not. I'm. I'm seriously telling you the truth. The game is super fun. Like we were here because we were supposed to have you again before before I I caught COVID, and I we were like setting everything up, and I just kept playing the game every while everyone was like testing the stream, and the mechanics feel so good, and like just the aspects of leveling your character up are really really fun. So you you've really made something nice. Can you talk uh, about you know your team? where you're at in the world because obviously you're not um in the states and it's interesting yeah, to see yeah. uh and talk to folks globally exactly i mean nice to hear that you guys uh like the the, the experience um you know that's what uh in the industry is about you know the community that the whole everybody can you know can enjoy this this industry yeah i'm from brazil uh, the Salvador is the, the, the state of Bahia. And yeah, I'll do my best with my English. I mean, I can hear better than the understand, but as I'm talking about more about the art stuff, I can, you know, <laughs> I mean, I can do it it's better. I mean, so uh, our team, basically all of us, we are, you know, uh from different places of uh, of course we are working uh i mean remotely like you know online uh even uh before the the this you know pandemias things but yeah i mean we are almost um, around six five or six guys you know working on it we have the director and uh, me in art guy in animation um the guy in sound and two or three guys that are doing the the code stuff so yeah oh cool what and so what course, role do you play on the team yeah i'm the artist oh okay awesome awesome <laughs> what what can you talk a little bit about the influences um that you've had that help you develop this style of game yeah, of course. Uh, I, th this is my first pixel art ever, you know. Uh, oh, wow. That's I, crazy. Yeah, I came from the advertising uh, industry. I'm an illustrator and a graphic designer. And But I but I, I started to, to, to do some, you know, concept art, uh, I mean, for my own, by myself. And uh, the director saw my work. On, uh, and on the internet and, and he he said yeah this guy can can give me what i want but he he have no uh piece of art of, uh, job at all and uh he called me and said hey what about this i have this game i i i see your work and i like it but you know, you have no piece of art in your in your stuffs and and he asked me if i want to try and then i start to you know I mean, yeah, give me a week, and I Google it, and <laughs> you know, start to to learn and read and try something, and then we start. This guy, the director, he he is a really talented guy. He have a lot of reference, and he have a you know a good and clear idea about what he wants, and that's why it was possible. He stayed beside me and said, "This is what I want. That's the way. That's the reference." And so uh we could do this so that's my first that's that's watch. super cool <laughs> that's crazy to it's awesome i think that's kind of a the hustle of a lot of indies is if you don't know how to do it you figure out how to do it right and it that's very admirable uh admirable i, I like muffle that one um that's cool can you tell us about and run us through the game like the story and 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 what alfonso is doing 
dying. Yeah, yeah. perfect. Uh, this is a Lovecraftian world, basically. <laughs> and of course, we can. The, the base of the, the, the structure is the. I mean, this guy is a guy, he's a, he's a mercenary. I don't know the, the name in, in, in English. But you know, people who work for money, whatever it is. And yeah, this guy have a some contract with a you know uh, you know another girl, the big boss one, and it will happen some you know plot twist between the game basically, and then you know we got a lot of uh, universe to explore. We have a lot of uh, um, how can I say this? Uh, It's all about, uh, uh, you know, crazy. What did he mean in English? Man, um, uh, this can go because yeah, it's missing a lot of uh, uh, words. No, <laughs> I'm sorry. No, it's all good. No, 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 it's all good. It's cool to hear about the world building and and some of the the structure and some of the monsters and. Um, where did some of the ideas for this, I know it's Lovecraftian, but some of the monsters and, and, uh, threats you face in the game. Yeah, basically, uh, we, we, I mean, we want to give the, to the players, uh, some classical structure. Of course I have, all of us have all those kind of reference, you know, it's kind of monster. I, we are always looking for the, the big one, the, the nice one, you know? uh when we're developing the the director want of of course it, it need to to work on the game as a in a um level design point of view but uh we also want to give to people some classical experience you know classical monster classical um you know creatures but at the same time with some originality you know? So that's the balance we, we are always looking for. Uh, we have some, I mean, uh, huge ones on this game, and there's some small ones. But uh, I, I can say this always about if it's fixed or not in the mechanic stuff, something like this. And of course, mm -hmm. is you have the mood of Lovecraft, uh, I mean, world, you know, uh, creature, those kind of statics. That's the that's the, the main guide. What? So this is this is your first? Is this your first game? Because you're talking about you were in graphic design and and illustration. Yeah, before, yeah, that's right? my first one in pixel art. I did I did another one, but it's still I mean finishing. But it was more, yeah, more 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 cartoony, uh, kind of fantasy cartoony stylish. The digital painting is more, uh, uh, yeah. Turn. This one was my first That's in pixel cool. art. It was really, really, um, you know, difficult to get in this world, understand how the whole thing is, is you know, is set it. I mean, all those because I I, I designed the, the those sprite sprite kits, you know, and then the the developer yeah. started to develop the. the those uh, rooms and then we back and take a look and see it's working and then back again so it's, it's really new process for me but uh, cool. I, I love it what advice really into... sorry oh no i was just gonna say since you you kind of hustled through this figuring out how to do pixel art and design what kind of advice would you give young developers just trying to get into game development yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll try to a uh, point of view for development. Ah, oh, man, be helpful. I mean, I studied with a guy and uh, he always told this. Uh, nice. Be helpful, right. try your best. Uh, I mean, because in, in the indie industry, I mean, we are really small teams trying to do our best and if you have a lot of skills, it will help you to be in the project and to help the project. Yeah? So in the development point of view, 
try to have uh it's not about being generalist it's about uh being able to help any kind of project in the, the um many ways as an artist man it's difficult because i mean gaming is a serious thing really serious thing you know? yeah and a, a, anything you do it's it needs a high quality independent of the style so as an artist you must have uh the ability to keep the quality and the structure i have to design all those creatures environments uh props and everything uh need to keep the level and the, the, the style it's not easy so as an artist yeah be prepared to uh you know a really uh, <laughs> <laughs> high challenge you gotta hustle yeah that makes sense um yeah, yeah i was uh, i was also gonna ask like it, it's crazy it's kind of like for this journey on black voicing in uh gaming today we went around the world pretty much john is in uh japan we had um someone in montreal we had another developer in germany des who's in who's been all over the world can you talk a little bit about the development scene in brazil like how is the camaraderie and how how does it play out yeah i, I mean we well, everybody know that we have been some problem with our government and they took off a lot of investments in you know cultural and, and you know uh those kind of stuffs and it compromised uh this industry here right now but we were kind of start to develop some good things i believe here in brazil because of uh because it's so mixture and we have a, a lot of talent guys here you know uh i always think that you, you come from a, a, a country on a city on a i mean a structure with no too much money it it invites you all the time to be more creative if not you can do nothing so i believe that we always have a, a potential but we are still no uh, working hard to start to to develop some uh name or position in this industry but yeah oh, i mean with internet today the whole world is just one so it's so easy to um you know to study to look for reference you know uh yeah that's it i mean today today we are really optimists and i i believe that yeah somehow in some way we'll do our you know we'll have our, our our identity also you know on this industry maybe yeah for sure what are the what do you think the most popular games are in in brazil right now that that folks play ah good point uh, i mean in the I mean, let's talk about the, the those triple A, the Elder Rings. Yes, it's a cat. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, I believe we here in Brazil, uh, the, the 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 type of players, they more about um, uh, casual, you know, the hyper casual players. And, uh, the, the, of course, the the, the this community in of uh gamers yeah of course this exists but i believe we we really like football games football yeah games like soccer mm -hmm. and but i believe today as in the in the, in the any place elder ring is something that everybody's talking about yeah that's that's cool i was it's, it was kind of hilarious because before and i knew elder ring was coming out but then when i when we were playing today and it was like elder ring, it's like so close to elder ring i'm wondering if you guys are gonna thinking about possibly changing the name last minute or are you gonna kind of 
like utilize that to your advantage <laughs> like to yeah, your advantage I have saw, you guys talked about good, that yeah good good point uh i saw um um uh kind of gif like maybe 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 i don't know the, the name in english but you know there's this kind of joke with image that's what uh, amazing there was a guy and they took the logo and said elder and that little hot do 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 and then uh and the rand and then they got to say what and they saw the the heart stop to to, to beat it and say elder ring it was a kind of joke with with this i believe oh that i get it someone like made a yeah someone made like a little meme that's that's hilarious yeah because yeah, yeah, i can yeah, see because yeah, yeah. i that's funny because I could see people like basically talking stuff about it and be like, oh, yeah, these are they, they're trying to like use the name. And you're like, no, man, we've been working on this for like four years. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Exactly. Um, that, that's the point. I think we, we, we have the name first because we have more than seven years designed this. Seven like years? Name. Wow. Yeah. I that's did not realize crazy. that's crazy. Yeah. 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 Uh, is it already on on the scene? It's already there. The, you know the the so and the, our director, he, this guy is really good with names. So he knew this name it would work in in you know elder, older, and land. Come on, this is not a <laughs> surprise. And Mike are, drops, and are, huh? No. Yeah, and we are surprised. Oh. Why doesn't anybody use this name? It's so so unique. And she was it was able, you know, she was there. So so the, he just used it. So Eldering, come on, I don't know. Maybe they cop us. Yeah. That's hilarious, yo. Yeah, that's funny. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so where can we find out more about uh Eldoran and your team? And do you have any more like um insight on when you're gonna be releasing? The game is dope. Yeah, yeah. We are already, we are already in the uh, Steam. So guys, please go there and wish list is wish list and you, you know. Uh, we already have a, a website, uh, elderrain.com. And of course, nice. Facebook, Twitter, and those in the community, Discord. Uh, yeah, head it maybe, yeah. For sure. Well, thank you so much, Yada, for joining us. We hope to talk to you soon again, and and please feel to reach, feel free to reach out. We would love to work with you on other stuff. Yeah, man. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you, God, for, for the opportunity again. So, yeah. We appreciate it. It's a wonderful game. Thank we'll you. We'll see you later. That was that was really dope. You that game is tough, and I think you actually were playing a loaded game, so you were like jumped into the middle of it. Yeah, I was like, all right, let's go. You're making you you were making stuff happen. Um, we want to shout out to our partners for today's show, Raw Fury for helping us get this series started um, and funding throughout the year. PlayStation has been amazing. Razor, we have some other ones popping in. What about the Steam page, Alfonso? Definitely go to the Steam page, the uh, the mix Steam page featuring the Black Voices and Gaming game titles. Check those out. Also, go ahead and buy those titles and wish list the ones that are not available. Um, that definitely helps developers um, and get some get some check that box what else are we that's hilarious i can, st I can st still hear yada um, what can people look forward to from black voice in gaming this is i'm just slapping this one no in there. i mean i think we're going to be looking forward to basically growing this community bringing it together adding more developers of color all over the world as you guys can see from the show um doing marketing doing uh streams for these developers uh promoting their their games um, publishing their games, so connecting them with large AAA organizations, and then also producing our own titles ourselves. So yeah. that's what you can yeah. expect from us. For sure. Um, and then we also have the freshman class, which we will be gathering some some dope indies and doing another poster and shirts and that type of thing, showing them love and working with, with the press on that. Special thanks to Wilmer Sound. We're in their beautiful facility oh, in I Berkeley. See. This place is amazing. We set up shop here at the Mix Team Media One, a la Joel in the corner, Mary in the crevice. I'm just kidding. Uh, again, my name is Justin Woodward, co-founder of the Mix Black Voices in Gaming, and also um, one of the advisors on the Black Game Developer Fund. And I am with my homie, Alfonso. Thank you for letting me be here with you again.
Awesome. For sure. It's it's been a great day. Um, you could follow Black Voice in Gaming at BVI Gaming on Twitter. Check out the games on blackvoiceandgaming.org. We are updating list constantly. You can also follow the mix on Instagram and Twitch at Media Indie Exchange on Twitter at Indie Exchange and me at ICJ Man. Thank you for joining us. We will see you soon. Peace. Peace.